University. She uh, became a vegetarian as a child, which is a fascinating story. You can actually get her to quite humorous to, to tell you that one. Um, has been a raw vegan for 19 years, a uh, natural hygienist. And um, she also has classical and metaphysical training in counseling and worked with people healing from disordered eating for over 20 years. And today she's going to be speaking to you about the social and emotional effects of, of diet and lifestyle. And um, I guarantee you this is really an amazing lecture. Um, and she's one of the most brilliant women I've ever gotten to know. So I, I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, Professor Rosalind Graham. Thank you. Lenny, I feel so humbled by the introduction. I just hope I can live up to 1% of it for you. Um, my topic today, I really do feel, is so important and really truly valuable for those of us who are trying to make dietary improvements and particularly those of us who are not necessarily finding that journey particularly an easy one. Um, how many people in the room have actually woken in the morning with an intention to eat in a certain way and by the time they've gone to bed that night are thinking, oh well I'll start again tomorrow? <laughs> um, is there also anybody in the room who has ever felt in a social situation challenged as to how best to deal with it in a diplomatic way? Yeah. Okay, right, well hopefully then most of you are in the right session at this point because that's what we're going to talk about. I have very short time actually to share with you what is actually a very large amount of information so I'm going to be quite concise. I hope to allow a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, where I'd like to start is actually with my baby daughter Francesca. Now, the reason I want to start there is because of perhaps alerting you or encouraging you to become aware of how much emotional pain we all may have experienced as children. Now, I know this is kind of going straight in from the get-go, but with just 45 minutes, we don't have much choice for dallying around, so I'm going to be really honest with you. Now, when we look at the baby creatures of the world, we know that some of those baby creatures are able to defend themselves from a very young age to some degree. Now, baby snakes, for example, some of them are actually even more poisonous than the parent snake. It's their way of protecting themselves from predators. A baby zebra can actually get up and run with the herd within a matter of just a few days. But there are certain babies of certain species that are completely and utterly vulnerable to being eaten by a predator unless protected by their parents. And humans fall into this category. Now, if you can imagine my little baby out there, Francesca, just being put down somewhere in a wild natural environment while parent walks off for an hour or so, the likelihood of that infant still being there when you got back, <laughs> yes, it fills you full of the horrors, darling, isn't it, just to think about it. <laughs> right on cue. Um, <laughs> what actually happens is that culturally, just the way we've become so perverted with regard to our food choices, the way that we treat our children and our infants is also vulnerable to that same type of perversion. We consider it normal to take a defenseless little newborn, place it in its little cot, in its separate bedroom where we leave it all night. Or we put it down in point A because it's asleep and we go away and only return when it's already been traumatized and is crying to discover it's on its own. Babies that was you <coughs> once have an inbuilt primordial knowing that the greatest danger as a baby is actually the danger of being eaten. And that is every baby's greatest fear, funnily enough, of being eaten. It might sound bizarre, but that's its true fear. Now, most of us have been brought up in a culture whereby it's considered normal to place our babies in play pens, in separate bedrooms, in push chairs and cots and prams, and to allow them to awaken to find themselves alone. Now, bear in mind, at that age, alone means anything out of their visual range, which is about six foot, yeah? And so they are repeatedly traumatized with a feeling of not only tremendous fear, but abandonment. Now, in nature, if there is a little creature that is in some way flawed, some way not quite good enough as its siblings, perhaps it's a little bird with a crumpled up wing, and it's there in the nest, and us as compassionate humans, hopefully, 
would want to reach out to that little infant bird and give it a special nurturing, a special care, wouldn't we? But is that what happens in nature? No. It is considered flawed and therefore allowed to perish. The siblings might be allowed to literally kick it out of the nest. The parents may very well not even bother to offer it food or even push it out of the nest themselves so it falls and crashes dead to the ground. That is the tragedy. But is it a tragedy? Because in truth, it's only the strong in every species that proliferate and therefore the species is able to survive as a strong species. We cannot have flawed members of each species reproducing progressively more and more flawed and crippled individuals until the species disappears. And it's the sad truth of nature. And just as much as we have an inbuilt fight or flight response, you know the one that prepares us to run off or fight when we perceive danger, which of course in the old days used to be, you know, the, the predator coming across the hill. In these days it's the bank manager telling you you're overdrawn again, you know. <laughs> you get prepared to fight or run, but hopefully you don't do either. Hopefully what you do is when he tells you that you're overdrawn, you stand there and you go, because you know your body's preparing itself for physical activity. <laughs> the most appropriate thing to do is do that. But the same way, deep down inside of us, we have this belief that if we are being abandoned, it's because we're not good enough. It's because we're flawed. And more to the point, we are literally in danger of being allowed to perish. Now, as we grow up as children, what happens then is that our parents see them as uh, see us as an extension of themselves because from a point of view of psychology that's generally what happens we see our children as an extension of us and anything we find unacceptable or intolerable with our own behavior should we see that in that child we will berate that child voraciously because it's something we find intolerable to accept that we actually own ourselves and so we perpetually hear, don't do this, don't do that, I don't like the way, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that, that's not nice, you're a bad girl, you're a bad boy. And so on top of this abandonment that's happened repeatedly, we have now got disapproval as well. And disapproval and abandonment equals you are flawed, you are not good enough, and in fact, you don't deserve your next inhale. And so in a desperate plea, what we try to do is to deliberately act and behave and speak in ways to get our parents' approval and the approval of the superiors around us. We start to dress in ways that will be approved of by our peers at school and later at work. We speak and adopt patterns of language that we think will be approved of. And all the time we're doing this, we're actually building a bigger and bigger facade of who we truly are. Can you see what I mean? Yeah? We start to literally separate ourselves from our own truth as to what we really are like, what we really prefer to wear, how we really prefer to talk and move and be, who we are, and we become a facade. And we're still trying to get the approval of our peers around us and our bosses at work and our relations and our friends and our family. We're still desperate to get some confirmation that we're not flawed, that we're not a lesser person, that we're not in some way different, therefore less capable with less potential than everybody around us. We're desperate for confirmation of this. And so we keep putting up this facade. But by the time we're adults, we have become such a facade of who we truly are that what happens is we have then committed the worst type of abandonment and that's self-abandonment. Because at that point, we don't truly know who we are anymore. We've just put so much energy into this thing of trying to get approval. And when somebody comes up to us and they say, oh, you're such a good listener. You know, I had that problem the other day. You just sat and listened and listened. You're such a good listener. And we puff up our little chests and we say, oh, I'm a good listener. <laughs> the very next day, somebody says, Honestly, you've got no time to listen. All you think about is yourself. I'm always listening to your problems. Can't you listen to mine for a change? And our little chests cave in and we go, oh, I'm a hopeless listener. I don't listen to people. And we spend our whole <laughs> life allowing who we are to be dictated by according to the other in, you know, insinuations of other people 
or the statements that other people make about us or the way people treat us. And this is the only way we get any sort of rough guess as to who we are. We don't know our own truth. And so you live a life of emotional mountains and valleys. When people are complimenting you and thinking you're the greatest thing, then you have a great day and the next day something happens and your whole life is affected. You just hit the ground, proverbially speaking. It's a very painful way to exist. And this is what I call the original pain. It started with your parents actually loving you but just following classical cultural ways of bringing up children that resulted in the primordial part of you feeling repeatedly abandoned. That was followed by their loving attempts to mold you into the perfect human being because they actually loved you so much, but in doing so, they conveyed to you disapproval. And with abandonment and disapproval, you believed yourself to be flawed. And that pain you've been carrying ever since. Now, I'm not saying that this is true for all of us. Please don't misunderstand me. I wouldn't be so presumptuous. I'm simply saying that in my experience, there is a vast number of people in this collective room, this number of people. There's bound to be a large number who this does apply to. And it's those of you that I'm reaching out to today. If it's not you, perhaps it's information you could share with a loved one who does suffer in this way. But the point is, how does this relate to our food choices? Well. I'd like to explain this. In order to have any understanding of your relationship with food, it's really important that you have an understanding of how your nervous system works. We're talking basic physiology. Your nervous system is a network of pathways that allows your brain to communicate with every cell in your body. It's like a giant telephone network if you want to look at it that way. Whatever is happening in your body on a cellular level is transmitted to your brain whereby that information is processed and messages are sent back to the cells of your body instructing them how to behave. Now this two-way communication runs on something which is effectively a low voltage electrical current. We call it nerve energy. Now, you can pick up a biochemistry book and you can read through all the various chemical reactions that occur within your body to create this charge. But at the end of the day, it's a low voltage electrical current. And we only have so much of it in our body at any one time. We're using it up in everything that we do. From cognitive thought, digesting food, conducting emotions, athletic endeavors, simple um, basic bodily processes of metabolism, we use it up in forms of conducting our heart rate, our respiration, everything that form goes on inside your body. Everything that you do in your day. Going shopping, putting the shopping in the car, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're using that nervous energy, cell to brain, brain to cell communication. Now, your body is very well equipped at being able to do many little processes all at once. Now, as I'm standing here in front of you, and as you're sitting in front of me, and standing, some of you, your bodies are monitoring your sodium potassium levels. Your, your brain, in fact, is monitoring the acid and alkalinity of your blood. Your brain is involved now in actually conducting the process of digestion for the lunch that you just ate. And your brain, of course, is involved in absorbing information that you're hearing verbally from me. And this is all going on at one time. The point is that when it comes down to really big tasks, your body is only designed to do one or the other. Yeah? It's a bit like, you know, us women are known to be multitaskers, right? And so I can stand there, and I've learned how to be breastfeeding Francesca and speaking on the telephone and just washing the kitchen floor at the same time, you know, <laughs> has been known. Uh, but if you said to me, look, I want to, you to make a gourmet meal for 18 people at the same time as writing a chapter for your new book and just uh, doing a bit of dressmaking, I mean, whoa, you know, I simply can't do all of that. And it's the same with your body. Now, the two of the most energy draining things that you can do are digesting food and conducting emotions, right? Now, let's be clear on this. There's a big difference between energy and fuel. People say food gives you energy. Now, if that were true, when you took Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, <laughs> the biggest meal of the day, 
where you put everything down and in's gone the pumpkin pie and the whatever it might be you have and this that and the other and it all goes down and then of course you have to remember about the after dinner chocolates and everything just to follow through you know maybe a bit of alcohol whatever it is you do and then you sit down <coughs> Now, just to prove that it doesn't give you energy, what do you think you would feel like doing after a meal like that if it gave you energy? <laughs> oh, let's go, let's go, can't be going to play tennis or something, or I just want to go for a run, I have so much energy. We don't do that, do we? We pick up the remote control and we go... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we do. Because it is exhausting on your nervous system conducting those sorts of complex digestive processes. What we do get from the food we break down is fuel, which is completely different from energy. Energy is related to the charge within your nervous system. <clears throat> the only way to charge up your nervous system is through sleep. If you don't get enough of it, you walk around all day like a battery that's slightly run out. And you calculate, you press in two plus two and you get seven and a half. <laughs> Now, if your body is only able to do one thing at a time when it comes to conducting intense emotions or digesting food, we realize that it is literally physiologically possible to eat yourself into a state of emotional numbness. Yeah? Is that anything any of you have become aware of, that it's possible to do that? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> That's right, this is the honesty session. We'll all have a sort of policy of confidentiality here, right? Okay. <laughs> now, how it works is this. Take two people who go through a bereavement. One person is so busy, involved in that sorrow and the sadness and the tears and the sense of loss that their brain knows that there is no available nervous energy <coughs> to conduct the processes of digestion. So the appetite will be switched off. And that person will go through the bereavement eating far less than they usually do, just picking occasionally and not feeling hungry and just, you know, bereaving terribly. At the end of that bereavement, they're going to have lost weight. Now we get the other person. And they are so overwhelmed by the whole idea of having lost this loved one. They can't even go there emotionally. It's too painful. And so where do you find them? In the kitchen, in the refrigerator, in the pantry, down the baker's store, wherever it is to get the food. Because if they put enough food in, it works as an emotional analgesic and they cannot feel. At the end of their bereaving, although it wouldn't actually have processed it properly, they would have put on a lot of weight. So it can work either way. Now how many times, unfortunately, do we eat in a way that is not congruent with our intentions and beat ourselves up for it. And by beating ourselves up for it, we're adding to the pain that we're trying to anesthetize. So we end up eating more because it's so painful. And then we feel even worse about what we've done. So we have to have more food as an emotional analgesic. And so it goes on and on and on. Yeah? We get on a nasty treadmill, a kind of cycle of behaving in this way. So how do we break this? Well, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to start creating what I call your encyclopedia of truth. And how that goes is like this. You take a quality, any quality that you like. It could be a quality that somebody has accused you of or insinuated is yours, or it could be a quality just that you know somewhere inside you leaves you feeling uncomfortable. Let's take, for example, that one I used earlier about being a good listener. Yeah? Let's take that as an example. What you do is you take that quality to court and first of all, you wear the hat of the prosecutor and you list down all the actual evidence that you've got that you're not a good listener. Okay, now it's no good saying, you know, because somebody told me I wasn't or, or because I don't think I am. It's got to be the sort of evidence that would stand up in court. You know, Wednesday, 2.30pm, friend calls up to talk about divorce, told her I simply hadn't got time, put the phone down. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Literal evidence, list it down. And when you've exhausted your list of all the evidence that you can come up with regarding the fact that you're a lousy listener, take that hat off and put a different hat on. And this hat is the hat of the defendant. And you come up with all the reasons that you can, all the evidence you've got that you're a darn good listener. Yeah? Tuesday, 9.30 in the evening. Mother calls up, wants to talk about her bowel movements. Okay? <laughs> you listen for 45 minutes, making appropriate ooh-ah noises. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> evidence, you're a good listener. You list down all the evidence you've got that you are a good listener. 
And then you take off that hat and you put on the hat of the judge. And you look at the list of information you've got proving that you're a lousy listener and the information that you've got proving that you're a good listener and you stand and you judge and you come to a conclusion whether you're guilty or not guilty okay and as the judge what you do is you pass sentence and that sentence is either currently I am a good listener or currently Listening is something I am working on changing. <laughs> I'm not good at it yet, okay, or I am becoming good at it. Yeah, you pass sentence. Now then, let's just have a little think of how this can relate even more specifically to diet. As you start working through every quality that crops up in your life, you will begin to compile an actual encyclopedia of what is true for you. Now when somebody, for example, then says... <laughs> Okay, okay, we're on again. <laughs> so, eventually then, you have your encyclopedia of truth. And at that point, when anyone accuses you or insinuates that there is some undesirable quality about you, you will have a great reply. And your reply will either begin, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Actually, I know that that is not true of me. Um, I know my own truth is that I am a very good dot 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 or whatever it is. Or you might say, thank you for sharing, yes I'm aware of that and it's something I'm working on developing. Okay. But either way eventually you get a greater and greater sense of your truth and you will not be dragged up onto mountaintops and down into valleys by the way other people treat you or speak of you or speak to you. You'll become far more centered. Now in terms of the digestive challenge, let's, let's just look at a continuum a moment. Do you know what I mean by a continuum? Like birth, death, middle of your life, cold, hot, warm, yeah? At one end of the continuum we have the suicide diet, okay? The suicide diet, otherwise known as a standard western diet, um, <laughs> it consists of all sorts of things that were never designed to be run through the human body in the first place. They are all in horrendous combinations that are totally indigestible and surrounded by any number of toxins, preservatives, flavorings, and it, it's a mess, okay? This is the suicide diet. Now, this is an enormous challenge for your nervous system to sort out that mess, salvage what it can in terms of nutrients, deal with the massive load of toxicity, and process the whole thing and remain alive as it's doing so. It's a massive challenge. And so emotionally, it's fairly effective, you might say, as being an analgesic. In fact, we are pretty numbed out on the standard suicide diet because we have no nervous system available to emote. But then maybe we are lucky enough to access a bit of education and inspiration that leads us to making a vegetarian choice for whatever reason that might be. It could be for reasons of animal rights, it could be reasons of ecology, it could be personal health. Those are the usual three legs of the stool. But we make that change to vegetarianism and now at least we're not running the dead bodies through the system. At least that's one thing, okay? So the digestive system is that little bit lighter, you know? We're not taking in quite as many poisons. And as it gets lighter, we start to feel a little bit. Hmm, okay, I'm feeling a little bit. I think I, think I can cope with this, providing I have enough bread and cheese and you know, keep putting in the, the digestive challenge. <laughs> but then there might become a point where we've got enough in touch with our emotions that we decide to make a vegan option. Because we're thinking, actually I do care about those little baby calves that are caged in those tiny things and can't even lie down or turn around and they're being made into veal and oh it's all terrible, I'm going to become a vegan. I'm not going to support that industry anymore. And so you make that choice. And now we've taken out the ovums and the mammary secretions mm -hmm. and the fermented mammary secretions. We've got the whole thing oh. out. And here we are with a diet which is actually a lot less toxic and a lot easier to digest. In fact, enormously so. And what we find is then, whoa, what are these emotions? Whoa, hey, hey, hang on. Okay, these woohoo, didn't know they were there. Okay, and we're doing all very well and fine, very well and fine until someone upsets us and then we go, we just need to go and have a cheeseburger. Okay. <laughs> and we're back down here, whoa, we might even slip down to here, it wasn't even a veggie burger, oh dear. But, but we can do it, we can, we can make that attempt again because we're feeling confident because now we're emotionally numb and we don't care. So we do it again and we go vegetarian, whoa, yes, I'm okay here, just about. And eventually we go vegan, oh my goodness me, I'm feeling passionate about things up here. Oh, this digestive challenge is really light now. Oh, yeah, I'm getting quite emotive and passionate about things. And the anger starts to come up. 
the suppressed anger from being abandoned when I was little. <laughs> I was always good enough, why weren't you nicer to me? Okay. <laughs> and it all starts to come up, okay? Now, of course, the biggest jump you can make is when you say, okay, I'm going to go raw vegan. Because what you do then is not only do you take out all the dead bodies and their entrails and the mammary secretions and the ovums and the fermented mammary secretions, at that point, we're up here where we're eating just the beautiful fruits and vegetables of the planet in their raw, natural state. In other words, our body doesn't have to deal with trying to untangle the mess that cooking has made of those foods. It's a much simpler, lighter diet. And at that point, whoa, woof, those emotions hit you like never before. These are like enormous now. You've got in touch with all that childhood inner pain. It's all happening. It's all spinning around in your head. You know, you're having kind of a midlife crisis, a teenage menarch and a mature menopause all at once, be you male or female. <laughs> and it, it's, all, it's all rolled into one. And what you're doing at that point is you're saying, OK, I can do this. I can stay raw vegan. All I need to do is I need to take these nuts and these dates and squash them together and make a little pastry case and then fill it up with avocado and a few bits of mame and pour over perhaps some tahini and yes, and sprinkle some coconut on top because the higher the fat content, the more emotionally numbing it is. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll add on a few bananas and we might put a bit more tahini on and possibly some peanut butter and then put a little more coconut on top and a dump of durian on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a knife and I'm going to cut into that pie and go, mm, I did it, I did it. I stayed raw vegan and emotionally numbed out, okay? <laughs> and then people say, wow, I've heard that a low-fat raw vegan diet is the ultimate diet to be on. And they try and make this step. But now, the hardest thing for the body to digest and process, which is fat, has been re radically reduced in the diet. And this means that you are totally in connection with your emotional self. And this can be a big challenge. So, you're up here, low fat, raw game, vegan diet, I'm going to do it, 80, 10, 10, no problem. Want to be a top athlete? Now I can do it, okay? And you're going along, and you're cycling along one day, and you look at the countryside, and everything's so beautiful and colourful, and you feel connected to everything, and, and that terrible row you have with that friend, and it all starts to come up, and the emotions and everything else, and before you know it, you're back in the kitchen, the dates and the almonds and the avocado and the coconut, and you're going for the high fat again. And it's all about using food as an emotional analgesic, okay? Now, my advice is that if you feel that you truly want to keep going along this continuum towards the ultimate healthy diet, which is a low-fat, raw, plant-based diet, then you need to be willing to develop equally the way in which you process your emotions and live with yourself on a spiritual, emotional level. Because if you're here on the continuum with regard to how far you've developed the processing of your own emotions and the development of your self-esteem, and yet you're trying to eat a diet that's up here, there's a mismatch. And you're going to keep finding yourself drawn back. And my experience tells me that whatever dietary improvements you're personally trying to make, be it standard diet to vegetarian, vegetarian to vegan, vegan to raw vegan, or raw vegan to low fat raw vegan, wherever you are on that continuum, if you are continually being dragged back one step, it's because the way in which you process your emotions has not been as developed in you as your understanding and application of nutritional principles. They have to go parallel, side by side, or you will keep being dragged back. Now, let's just bear in mind that there are certain foods which tend to cause people to become addicted to them. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Aboriginal culture. Anybody here, to some degree? Yeah, a little bit? Yeah. It's funny because, you know, I'm sort of the typical English rose through and through, you know, I'm frightfully British, absolutely fabulous, darling. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, although I must admit I don't have a cup of tea at the slightest provocation like I used to. But the number of people that come up to me in the States and they say, oh, what part of Australia do you come from? So I say, the British part. <laughs> <laughs> However, I, I'd love to visit Australia one day. And um, my studies of the Aboriginal culture have led me to have tremendous respect for them as a very reverent 
um, group of people. However, when the Westernized introduced alcohol to them, because they have a, pre pre a genetic predisposition to be vulnerable to becoming addicted to alcohol, you have only literally to give them one bottle of whiskey and they're alcoholics for life. It's a tragedy. And now, of course, they have a reputation for being a, a load of drunken bums. Well, in fact, they've only become that due to this sort of genetic predisposition to be especially vulnerable to alcohol. My experience is that some of us are more genetically predispositioned to become vulnerable to the addictive qualities of certain foods than others of us. Yeah? Those addictive qualities are in those foods anyway. But some of us tend to have, for some reason, a bit more of an, an, an aptitude, let's say, for getting hooked on them. Now let's take grains, for example. Grains contain inordinate numbers um, of opioids. I mean, a lot of foods contain opioids, but nothing like grains do. Does the word opioid remind you of anything? <laughs> <laughs> Opium, oh yes, okay. Grains also stimulate the brain stem secretion of a neurotransmitter called um, serotonin. And I'm sure you athletes are very familiar with serotonin. It's kind of the feel-good factor when you exercise a lot. Well, you get that feel-good factor multiplied many times when you consume grains because they stimulate the secretion of the stuff. Um, in addition to that, you know, let's take a look at chocolate. Chocolate, you know, trust me, <laughs> that's all I can say on this one. Anyone who is telling you that chocolate is a health food <laughs> is telling you that for only one of two reasons and possibly both. Reason number one, they're trying to justify their own behavior. Reason number two, they're trying to sell it to you. Okay? Chocolate contains cannabinoids. Sounds like cannabis by any chance? Chocolate contains theobromine, a highly toxic alkaloid that has been compared to street crack regarding how addictive it can be. Refined sugar, what goes up must come down. And caffeine, whew, gives you a kick. And so when we think about it, we think, well, certainly when we put chocolate with grains, whoa, then we've got a good one, haven't we? Yeah, chocolate chip cookies, chocolate cake. What have we got? We've got opium. We've got a serotonin kick. We've got cannabis. We've got caffeine, theobromine, and refined sugar. Whoa! We're cheered up, chilled out, boosted up, relaxed down, and blended out. <laughs> <laughs> all in one food. You know, I used to have this thing going where I would say, if I'd been really good all week, <coughs> it's adhered to my raw vegan diet all week, I'd allow myself this vegan chocolate cake down at the local cafe on a Saturday. <coughs> And every Saturday I'd go down, oh, you know, and sometimes I'd cheeks, I hadn't been that good, but I had it anyway. And I'd go down, <laughs> and I'd have this piece of vegan chocolate cake. And then one day the waiter bought it and put it down in front of me, and I had the fork poised about here. And I suddenly looked at this cake, and I thought, how dare you govern my life? I govern my life, you're nothing but a, a piece of cake. <laughs> and I looked at it, and I thought, I thought, what do you give me? You give me spots on my skin, you give me obesity, mood swings, headaches, you know, constipation, all these things. And I thought, I don't want this, I don't want you. Get out of my life. And I pushed back from the table, I called the waiter over, I said, can you please take this away? He said, I'm sorry, madam, is there something wrong with it? Isn't it any good? I said, it's never been any good. <laughs> He looked at me and beetled off. <laughs> um, never try to give up something, it's deprivation. Only identify things that are not trying to take you where you're trying to go and send them packing, get rid of them. But don't try to give up anything. If you're giving it up, you've got it on a pedestal and you're attempting to deprive yourself of it. That's not very self-loving. Identify it as something that is not helping you, that is not serving you, and get rid of it. Yeah? That is the advice. Chocolate, grains, classics. Put the two together, phew, you could be hooked for life. Yeah? Socially, wow. Time goes so quick. <laughs> Socially, um, firstly what I would say is this. I, I mean, I've spent my entire life being weird, okay? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when, I, when I was a little girl and I chose a vegetarian option, I mean, I was the only one in our entire village that even heard of the word. That they was doing it. So I was a weird child. People used to walk around me in the street. It's that weird child. Um, <laughs> but by the time the word vegetarian had become real common in my village, I decided that I'd become a vegan. <laughs> so once again, even the vegetarians, whoa, she's a bit weird. <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't even do the milk thing. Um, and then, of course, taking a raw diet and lifestyle, I became the ultra weird. <laughs> kind of proud of it too, you know. <laughs> so good being weird, isn't it? 
The point is that when you are doing something different from your peers, your peers want to know who is wrong. Is it you or is it them? Because we are a gregarious species and it is within our natural psychological makeup to try and match those around us. Yeah? Now, as, as we know, there is a massive connection between people's lack of self-esteem and their inborn fears and pain and the foods that they eat, allowing them to subdue or numb them to that pain and distress. And if you suggest to that person that it would be actually best if they took that emotional numbing away, that's a very frightening thing for them to perceive, let alone implement. And so what they're going to do is they're going to do their best to prove that you're wrong and that they're right so that they can justify their eating habits and remain living on emotional analgesics. Okay? So firstly we need to remember that entering into conversation with anybody about your food is not governed by them, it's governed by you. You do not, I repeat not, under any circumstances have to tell people the reasons that you eat the diet that you choose. Okay? You don't have to justify what you do. You really don't have to. People say, why do you eat the way that you do? Oh, I like it. Do you think um, it's going to rain tomorrow? <laughs> Usual question in England. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't rain every day, I have to tell you. It was 90 degrees a couple of weeks back, apparently. 100 degrees last summer. <laughs> You'll all be flocking to England come January, won't you? <laughs> I can tell. Um, <laughs> you don't have to justify your diet, okay? But if you do, bear in mind that when you enter into a conversation with somebody, they're either genuinely interested because they're what we call a fringe dweller. They're already considering making some kind of change. They've become aware that we exist out there and could this be right for them too? And they're genuinely interested. Or they are not a fringe dweller and they will be trying to get you back their side of the fence. And generally speaking, there are exceptions, but it usually comes, only comes into one of those two categories. If you've got somebody who's genuinely interested, I encourage you to not thrust information down those people's throats, but to make them really work for it. Really drag it out of you because then they'll feel they own it, they worked for it. Okay. <laughs> Whereas if you're giving them the entire contents of Diet for a New America in one meeting, they're going to be like, whoa, okay, okay, I only asked, I only asked. <laughs> and they're not going to be receptive to it. The most powerful way to teach is by example, not by verbal communication. Yeah? If people ask you the classic question, what is it? Where do you get your protein? You say, I don't know, ask an elephant. You can say what you like, or you can go into detail. But amongst athletes, what I will tell you is this. If anyone questions your diet as an athlete, if you're choosing a vegan diet, and particularly also if you're choosing a raw vegan diet, I mean, I could stand here for a week and tell you the effects it has on your physiology when you take a vegan choice or a raw vegan choice, but I'm going to narrow it down to like um, two minutes. You can talk about oxygenation of your system, okay? Now firstly, you can tell people, if you're a raw vegan, you can say to people, well, you know, there are two amino acids that are absolutely vital. I mean, first of all, by the way, when somebody says, why do you eat the way you do, and you want to talk about it, you can ask them how much time they have, okay? <laughs> Always, it'll, it'll, that'll, that'll set them back a pace. You say to them, first of all, there are two amino acids that your body needs in order to produce cysteine and methionine. Do you know one of the things you need cysteine for? The formation of your red blood cells. Yeah? Do you know what you need methionine for? Amongst other things. The formation of hemoglobin. Are you aware of the fact that it is your ability to produce red blood cells and hemoglobin that enables you to get oxygen across from the alveolus of the lung into the microcirculation? Are you aware of that? Let me tell you a story, because you're looking blank. <laughs> There's this princess, you see, and her name is Princess Oxygen. And Princess Oxygen is there floating around in the atmosphere, minding her own business, when she suddenly gets sucked down these two big holes here, or this big hole here. And she tumbles down through the passageways, a bit like Alice in Wonderland, falls, but it's different, okay. Tumbles <laughs> down the passageways and lands, boom, in this transparent bubble, which is the alveolus of your lung. 
and she's looking out through this transparent bubble and she sees the magical wonderland of the inside of the human body and there's mountains and valleys and trees and flowers and little birds and bunny rabbits hopping about and it's, it's beautiful mm -hmm. and then she sees there's a whole network of red brick roads you've heard of the yellow brick road <laughs> nothing to do with that red brick <laughs> roads okay these are the body's capillaries, which in England we call capillaries. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you ever want to learn to speak proper English? Anyway, ca capillaries. There's a red brick road all over the place, and she sees galloping down one of these red brick roads this beautiful horse upon who is riding this rather fetching-looking knight in shining armour called He-Man Globian. <laughs> the horse's name is Red Blood Cell. Bear with me. <laughs> so there is Heman Globin, astride Red Blood Cell, cantering down this red brick road capillary. And as he gets closer, the princess gets a good look at him. And she looks and she looks and she says, Ooh, he's rather luscious. And so she sort of writes her crown and puts her hair straight, you know. And she bursts through the wall of the transparent bubble, the alveolus, through the wall of the capillary, both of which happen to be cast gas permeable, and leaps onto the back of the horse, puts her arms around his waist, and they gallop off into the sunset, and he, she is delivered wherever she's needed around the body. It's so romantic. <laughs> Next time you want a romance story, go straight to the physiology department. It's full of it. <laughs> This is how you get oxygen into your body. You have to have red blood cells. You have to have hemoglobin, an iron-rich compound. You need cysteine and methionine to do this. As soon as you cook your foods, you make cysteine and methionine minimally available to your body. You massively reduce your body's ability to oxygenate itself as soon as you cook your food. Yeah? Heated fats are sticky. Therefore, when they pass through into your blood circulation, you can cause blood cells to stick together, forming what we call little thrombus, yeah, a form of embolism or blockage by fragment. By that happening, you have reduced the overall surface area for gaseous exchange. Instead of individual blood cells, you have a clump. Once again, you have reduced your body's ability to oxygenate itself. Yeah? As soon as you go from, from animal fats to plant fats, you massively increase your ab body's ability to oxygenate itself because of the types of fats that you're dealing with. As soon as you go from cooked vegan to raw vegan, you instantly, enormously increase your body's ability to oxygenate itself. And most people are aware that you need oxygen up here in order to think straight. You need oxygen to your muscles to perform athletically. And did you know that your cells are dependent upon oxygen to remain cellular, nor to maintain cellular normalcy? And that when human cells have been subjected to carcinogens, that's substances that can contribute to causing cancer or cause cancer in and of themselves, when those same cells have been flooded simultaneously with oxygen, cancerous changes do not occur. Whereas when those cells are deprived of oxygen, the presence of carcinogens, they turn cancerous very quickly. So you can say to people who ask you, you know, why are you picking a raw vegan diet or why are you picking a vegan diet? And without going into the thousands of other reasons I could give you, you can simply say, because I want to oxygenate my body properly. I want to get oxygen to my brain to think straight, to the cells in my body to remain cancer free, and to my muscles for my athletic performance. And by choosing a vegan diet, I massively increase my ability to do that. And I times that by several times more when I take a raw vegan diet. Yeah? And that's enough as an answer. When you are faced with a social situation, simplify, don't complicate. Don't call somebody up and say, I'm coming to dinner, look, I'm awfully sorry, but I've got this really special dietary need, and I know this is a real pain in the backside for you, but could you possibly... And don't do that. You call them up and you say, you're going to love me because I'm going to be the easiest person for you to feed at your dinner party. <laughs> but I do have a couple of special requirements, if you wouldn't mind, but it's just so simple. So all I need you to do is to get the biggest mixing bowl you have in your house just <laughs> fill it with chopped up green vegetables and fucking sh shucking three tomatoes. Chop up an avocado, throw it on the top. Oh, I'll be so happy I'll be in heaven. You know, hosts want to please you. <laughs> Providing you go home, A, not hungry, B, with a smile on your face, and C, approving of them. Remember, they're suffering the same pain as you are. <laughs> you know, if, if, if they feel they haven't met your dietary need when you go home, they're going to be the ones stuffing down all the food because they're trying to suppress the emotional pain. <laughs> they want your approval, your smile, and the fact you're not hungry anymore. And you show them how to do that in the simplest way. 
The other thing is trust in Allah but tie up your camel. <laughs> in other words, you communicate what your needs are but you go prepared. Okay? You have the ripe avo in your bag in case they didn't quite comprehend what ripe meant. Okay? <laughs> you have the extra two romaine lettuces stashed in your car just in case they thought that a little side dish was a main salad for you. Okay? You go prepared. You warn people in advance. And whatever you do, don't get into conflict with people about your diet. Yeah? If you need to be defensive about it, it's because you're not demonstrating it enough. You need to be a physical demonstration. My little daughter, I think, is about ready for her physical demonstration. Daddy was instructed to bring her in if she needed a little top-up. <laughs> this is her San Francisco outfit. She's a flower girl. <laughs> um, folks, I truly hope that some of what I've shared with you is of help to you or at least one of your loved ones. I know we've run out of time, um, and I think in courtesy of the next speaker, I need to close right there. Sorry we didn't have time for questions, but I will be around for the rest of the day till there's no one left to talk to. So if you have any questions, do come personally, and I'd love to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.